Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this roundtable discussion uh, topic uh, uh, is US, Japan, and Philippines trilateral summit bolstering deterrence in the Indo Pacific. And we have a, a stellar panel for this roundtable discussions with Professor uh, Yoshiro Sato. Uh, he has joined us from the Japan. Professor Sato is a, a distinguished professor in Ritus in Asia Pacific University and the Dean of the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies and a visiting senior fellow at uh, ISEAS uh, USOP ISAC Institute. He works extensively on US-Japan alliance and regional security dynamics. We have Colonel Jeffrey uh, Holman with us. Colonel Hallman is the Chief Mission Assurance Division, J-34, Headquarters, United States, Indo-Pacific Command, and Hawaii. As a J-34, he is responsible for establishing policies and procedures to implement anti-terrorism, critical infrastructure protection, and performance readiness and integration across the Asia-Pacific region. He served in the various positions uh, the, uh, in the office of the, in the U.S., uh, uh, command. Uh, welcome, uh, Colonel Holman and Professor Sato. And uh, next, we have uh, Professor Renato Cruz de Castro. He's a distinguished professor at the Department of International Studies, De La University, De La Salle University in Manila, and uh, holds the Dr. Orleo Caladron Chair in Philippines American Relations. He extensively writes about the Indo Pacific security and the US. Philippines uh, relations and Southeast Asian nations. And then we have uh, Jose, Mr. Jose Custodio. He is a fellow at a Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers, and uh, he frequently writes about the Southeast Asian security aspects and issues. And he frequently uh, presents uh, his research on TV and uh, on and the media. Uh, he, and uh, he has joined us uh, from California. So welcome you all. And this event is organized and hosted by the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers, a policy and research organizations based in USA. And I am Indu Saxena, uh, the Chief Operation Officer of the Consortium at the Consortium. So welcome you all. And uh, this roundtable discussions is on um, this uh, on the important topic that we have been talking around in the last week, uh, that is uh, regarding the Indo-Pacific security. It was a very important week. So President Biden hosted two pivotal re leaders from the region, uh, President Kishida from Japan and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, President Marcos from the Philippines. And what is culminated that the joint vision statements from the leaders of the Japan, the Philippines, and the United States. Uh, this is the first our trilateral summit uh, in uh, Japan, US, and Japan, and Philippines. And uh, uh, just to, to start this discussion, uh, the first question is this, uh, uh, we would like to have uh, two main takeaways of this summit. Uh, regarding both regionally and globally. How our experts uh, see this summit? Um, and so I would like to start with Professor Sato. Professor Sato, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Indu. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the the consortium to invite me into this uh, forum. Uh, good to see you, Reni. Uh, first of all, I think this uh, trilateral uh, meeting was uh, very significant in the sense that uh, the close bilateral alliances, uh, respectively between US and Japan and the US and the Philippines, uh, uh, forged into uh, even closer uh, trilateral partnership, not quite trilateral alliance, but uh, trilateral partnership. And 
a lot of coordinations are taking place between those two respective alliances. And uh, this uh, efforts, first of all, anchors the US commitment and the presence in the region. And the second significance, I think, is that uh, inclusion of the Philippines out of uh, many Southeast Asian countries serves as a glue between the US-Japan alliance and ASEAN countries. So, so in that sense, uh, it was very significant that the joint statement uh, made an explicit reference to uh, the ASEAN centrality as well as the ASEAN outlook for uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, similar uh, consideration was paid to the Pacific Island Forum as well, but uh, most significantly within the same paragraph in the joint uh, statement by the three leaders, there was explicit mention that the three leaders welcome uh, other emerging frameworks, including uh, the Quad and also the AUKUS. So uh, this is very significant that uh, the Philippines, uh, sub Philippines is supportive of all these uh, non-ASEAN uh, frameworks to be part of the regional security architecture. So I think I'll stop here for now and maybe hear more from other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sato. Uh, Kana Holman, uh, what, what are your intake of this summit and uh, the joint vision statement? <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Indu. And uh, before I get started, I just wanna say, thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this panel. Uh, this is a very exciting topic. There's a lot going on, obviously, with this uh, trilateral relationship. Um, and anything that I share with you today is open source off the Internet. Um, and, I, and my views don't necessarily represent uh, my command or the Department of Defense. But I think some of the uh, most significant takeaways for me uh, were the fact that, uh, you know, we saw the first announcement of a real significant IPEF project. So the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, you know, that had been criticized early on as, as not really taking off uh, so much as the other pillars had. Uh, and so this really, and I think it's, it's fitting that it's with the Philippines and Japan uh, to really launch that IPEF effort uh, by way of this uh, Luzon Corridor, Economic Corridor. And I know we'll talk about that more later. Uh, the other thing that was significant uh, of note uh, from my perspective uh, was that they announced an upcoming uh, first, which will be a trilateral cyber and digital dialogue. So we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, new uh, information in the news lately about uh, the importance of cyber and, uh, you know, the threats that are out there, both from state and non-state actors. Uh, so I think it's uh, important that the Philippines and uh, with Japan being involved as well, uh, are able to uh, lean on the U.S.'s expertise in this area to bolster, um, you know, these the cyber defenses uh, for all uh, involved. So, um, yeah, those are the two main takeaways for me. Yeah, thank you, Colonel Holman. Uh, Jose, uh, uh, please, uh, what do you think that uh, how important it is, uh, and what are your takeaways? Well, my, my takeaway is basically is that um, today, in this year, we are commemorating 80th, the 80th anniversary of uh, a number of World War II uh, battles, okay? Meaning to say that um, uh, later Gulf landing, October of uh, um, October 1944, so now it's 2024, so it's eight years later. So who were, what were once enemies are now close allies. So that's a very big, and it's it's the evolution of Japan from a state that was uh, only um, that was um, constrained to operate within its own borders to now that is projecting. But it took a long time for that, okay, uh, for that to happen. And um, 
when I was still working in the Philippine government uh, almost uh, like uh, 50 years ago or almost 20 years ago, uh, there were already steps that the Japanese were taking to reach out okay, to its uh, um, uh, neighbors in Asia. Okay, And now we're seeing the, the, the concrete manifestation of that through this uh, uh, trilateral um, uh, activities. Okay. Then second, of course, is that it's high time that this happens because for the Philippines, it's a bit, it's better late than never, okay? Because we suffered through six years of, of, um, of uh, misdirection during the Duterte administration. That's putting it mildly, okay? Uh, then, so now we, we're having, uh, we're having uh, uh, activities with our allies and partners okay? um, that, will um, result in a much more effective pushback against China, okay? because we've always been, because basically we all know that this is, this is intention of this is to push back against China's inroads that it made in the past uh, years, okay? So, so I, I'd stop there and, um, and uh, yeah. uh, allow the next person to. Okay, yeah, sure, uh, thank you. And uh, Professor Zanetto, we want to hear uh, from you too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good morning. I'm uh, currently in, right now in Singapore, so uh, yesterday, I was reading a statement from the Department of Foreign Affairs, which is, of course, a uh, in a way, a reaction to a stronger statement, strong statement that was issued by the Chinese Foreign Ministry criticizing the trilateral alliance. So that now you have this tit for tat. And of course, this reflects the fact that the Chinese are very much aware of the implication of this trilateral arrangement. So I'll just basically mention the implication. Number one, of course, is that you have the creation of what I call a link between two alliances, you know, hubs and spoke system. The Philippine-US mutual, uh, mutual Defense uh, Treaty, and of course the 1961 US-Japan security relationship. So now you have, of course, a triangular, it's not an alliances, I agree with uh, my friend uh, Sato-san, it's a security partnership, but this is a security partnership that has been evolving. So. What are the manifestation of this evolution? Uh, you go back in time during a time of the Arroyo administration, when there was a course uh, um, opening made by the Arroyo administration towards China. This caused, of course, a concern on the part of Tokyo. So this is the first time that Tokyo raised the prospect of a security dialogue. Then we go to the Aquino administration in the aftermath of the Scarborough Shoal standoff where it became apparent that the Philippines, specifically the Philippine Coast Guard, lacks Coast Guard vessels, Japan stepped in. Uh, they, of course, the Coast Guard vessels could not be provided directly by the U.S., so it's Japan that's stepped in. Then uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Mr. Custodio, mentioned about the Duterte administration. You also have the active role played by Japan, specifically by the late Shinzo Abe. You know, a, a week after Duterte announced in Beijing that he was separating from the United States, Duterte went to Tokyo and he was told by the late Shinzo Abe, don't drop the Americans like a hot potato. So you have the active role being played by Japan. Now what we are seeing right now is, of course, in a way, the culmination of this long process of a creation of a, secu a triangular security partnership. Of course, you don't have this kind of relationship if you don't have any exigencies in mind. Of course, the first one is the South China Sea issue, and that probably the second one is, of course, the Taiwan Straits. Uh, just the last point, oh, sort of a takeaway. Uh, Sato-san mentioned about ASEAN. I'm here in Singapore, and I heard directly from some of the ASEAN colleagues that they're not very happy by the fact that the Philippines has gravitated closer to the alliance system. That's, Of course, that's the case of the Philippines, where the only ASEAN country that has an active security relations with the United States. You have Thailand, but of course, uh, we don't think that the security relationship between Thailand and the United States is that active. And of course, it's only the Philippines among the ASEAN member states that consider China as the clear and present danger. So that's a takeaway. In a way, this puts the Philippines in a sort of a uh, dilemma between what we call the ASEAN centrality and of course, the significance of its security relations and partnerships within the hub and spoke system. I stop here. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you all raised a very interesting uh, points. Uh, and uh, like, uh, um, uh, Renato, you mentioned that it's it's a 
uh, process that started in the Deuterate administration and culminated in the Marcos uh, administration. And it's a kind of evolution that we have been witnessing from the Japan, if we want to see the from the side of Japan to the Philippines. Yeah, um, like Japan uh, uh, has increased its spending uh, in the defense budget, 2%. And uh, yeah, that's, a, um, it's a, say, a courageous and bold step by both countries. And uh, uh, I, I will take uh, your uh, your brief comment on that. What prompted these countries? Yeah, I, I, I know that you mentioned South China Sea and East China Sea. And uh, this joint statement is very ambitious, very broad, and uh, it clearly mentions uh, uh, about the uh, tensions and escalations, uh, es escalations in South China Sea and East China Sea. And uh, we will also discuss about the regional implications that um, Professor Renato mentioned. So uh, just uh, I want to know that uh, uh, is this China's China's uh, maritime assertiveness is the only reason that prompted these two countries or there are something else behind this. So just a brief comment from you, any of you uh, wants to. Uh, can I end? I think it's a yeah. Taiwan issue. It's okay. a Taiwan issue. Okay. The fact that, uh, you know, it's already been indicated between the United States, Washington and Tokyo that Taiwan is of course is seen as a security issue on the part of the Philippines between the United States and the Philippines, the uh, provision of the uh, you know additional what we call enhanced defense cooperation site located in Northern Luzon indicates that between the United States and the Philippines, there's an understanding that the Taiwan exigency or contingency is a clear and present concern. So again, you have the convergence of both the interests of the Philippines and Japan regarding, of course, the uh, the you know the uh, I call the quintessential. <laughs> uh, flashpoint in the Indo-Pacific region. South China Sea, yes, but I think the quintessential, the clear and present flashpoint is, of course, Taiwan. Okay, God, thank you. And uh, any anyone of you wants to go or should we move to the next question? Oh. Okay, so like the uh, that we are just uh, taking it uh, in, in the discussion and it's it's like uh, how uh, your discussion evolves and when we go to the next question, like considering the current geopolitical landscape in the in the region. And we are talking about ASEAN centrality and um, ASEAN's uh, outlook uh, uh, of Indo-Pacific. Uh, but again, uh, the Philippines, uh, with, uh, again, it, it's a... Uh, it's a very uh, daring step from the only the Philippines is the only country in the ASEAN that uh, uh, did this kind of security partnership and enhanced uh, uh, enhanced defense uh, cooperation uh, with the United States. How reliable is the U.S. security guarantee to these countries amidst uh, uh, potential conflict with China's uh, maritime assertiveness? And when we see that U.S. is uh, engaged in two more conflicts uh, simultaneously in the Ukraine war and the in the Middle East, uh, Professor Sato, uh, uh, would would you like to uh, go uh, for this uh, question? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, when you're p paying too much attention to the political leadership in the United States, especially the president then uh, sure the, the Donald Trump period uh, uh, caused a lot of anxiety among the agents and uh, US commitment uh, was, uh, was shaky because of Trump's uh, kind of isolationist tendency and uh, the America first uh, rhetoric. However, I think uh, it's very important, uh, especially for you know, the Asian academics, including myself and Reni, to, uh, uh, as we do, to pay attention to the, not only the U.S. willingness, but uh, also uh, the U.S. capability depends on how much Asians can contribute to the collective defense effort against China. After all, the security in the Western Pacific region is not only for the U.S. security interests, it's definitely for Asian security interests as well. And if Asian countries are not doing enough 
and perceived as such by the U.S., then it would be more difficult for the U.S. leader to commit the United States to the defense in this region, although it is still a critical uh, interest for the United States, it becomes politically difficult for the U.S. leaders. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, this trilateral coordination is uh, a step forward to show to the United States that uh, the Asian countries are serious about defending, uh, uh, defending themselves and uh, pay the due cost of this collective uh, defense effort. And since uh, uh, Rennie referred to Taiwan, uh, I think this is very important that the joint statement, including the Philippines, made an explicit reference to their shared concern over the Taiwan Straits. I think this was a step forward compared to uh, some year earlier when the the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement uh, between the U.S. and, and the Philippines opened uh, some Philippine bases to the access by the U.S. forces, but those bases were primarily for uh, deterring China in the South China Sea and away from Taiwan. So from that time, I think this joint statement made a small step forward for committing the Philippines uh, to take some part in the Taiwan Strait contingency. Yeah, I directly uh, mentioned Professor Sato that uh, this, is the, uh, this is the first time that Philippines took this step, like uh, when there is a joint statement with the United States and Japan is a, uh, as a, uh, alliance not the uh, security alliance like a long time ago and uh, but uh, the taiwan state like every country avoids when there is a comes to the when there is an issue comes to the taiwan state except the u.s treaty allies except the u.s treaty allies so it it is it's very significant uh, uh, that uh, the uh, south is uh, south asian countries southeast asian countries they are looking uh, looking for their security guarantee or security provider to, towards the U.S. So uh, I would like to take uh, the uh, Colonel Holman's um, thoughts uh, here on, on this. Colonel Holman. Yes, thank you, Dr. Indu. Um, certainly, I think uh, we've heard in a number of uh, venues that each of these bilateral and trilateral um, agreements represent an ironclad commitment by the U.S. Uh, and I think we put our money where our mouth is. You know, we've been uh, a defense partner with Korea for decades, Japan decades as well. And of course, we know the treaty with the Philippines goes back uh, into the middle of last century. So um, certainly, I think it's clear that we're not going anywhere. Uh, we've also got other major allies and partners in the region that are counting on us to help counterbalance, uh, you know, China's assertiveness. And so I think, you know, the Philippines taking part in this trilateral summit and taking the stand that they are against China uh, and its excessive claims in the South China Sea uh, is really, uh, you know, it's, it's really unprecedented. No one has really stood up uh, to China to this extent in the past. And uh, I think their, their Coast Guardsmen uh, and their uh, troops out there on the uh, BRP Sierra Madre are, uh, you know, they've got to be sweating it, uh, you know, as, as they're going out knowing they're going to face that kind of uh, resistance uh, from, you know, Big Brother China. So, but I think, again, in closing, I think the U.S. security guarantee is ironclad. I don't see us going anywhere. Thanks. Uh, and would you like to uh, say something on the the shoulder to shoulder drills that is uh, that is happening right now in in, in the South China Sea, like a Baliktan uh, military drills? So so and and China again uh, is not happy with this whatever the, uh, this exercise is going on with Philippines. And I would also like to take the uh, Professor Renato to but first uh, Colonel Holman, uh, uh, what uh, what's your thought on this? 
So uh, how it will yeah, so the, yeah, yeah the, the Balakatan uh, exercises have been going on for a number of years. Uh, we just saw in the news in the last day or so that the Philippines has uh, extended the invitation to Japan to fully participate in next year's uh, Balakatan. Uh, they are, of course, an observer this year. So that's a big step to go from, you know, an observer to a full participant. And I think that will really cement uh, this relationship and give uh, all three countries a real good opportunity uh, to test out some some theories of interoperability and, uh, you know, further, uh, you know, refine that relationship. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, introducing some new capabilities uh, into the Philippines. Uh, Salakanib was another exercise that preceded this year's Balakatan. And uh, we saw in the news that there was a, a new army uh, long range uh, missile system that was brought in so that they could test out the logistics uh, of operating such a system from the Philippines. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of uh, activity, defense activity among these three uh, partners that, that is really going to start to uh, provide a, a very complex problem for uh, the PRC. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dan. Um, uh, Renato, uh, would you, uh, what's your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the Bali Katan, uh, you know, especially the two or three years ago, has shifted really on what we call the euphemism used in the Philippine military, territorial defense. So it's for conventional war fighting situation. And of course, this coincided with a new Philippine grand strategy called the Comprehensive Archipelagic Defense Concept, which of course basically announces the armed forces of the Philippines to the Filipino nation, to China, to the world, that the armed forces of the Philippines after, you know, been focused on internal security, counterinsurgency in the last seven decades, is now basically uh, have adopted a war fighting orientation that's geared primarily for external defense. So Balikatan would play a very vi a vital role in terms of in a way, winning, winning, I mean, uh, push, pulling the Philippines away from internal security and preparing them for its new role in the 21st century. That is, of course, external defense, looking at the prospect of conventional war, specifically in the maritime domain. And I would like, again, to mention what is mentioned by the Colonel regarding the Typhoon missile system. This is, of course, not just new. It represents a new generation of intermediate range ballistic missiles. This, of course, will be possibly introduced in the first island chain and will, of course, play a vital role in ensuring not only the security of the Philippines, but Taiwan and, of course, even Japan, creating what they call the archipelagic defense concept that would link the security of Japan, Taiwan, and, of course, the Philippines. Thank you. Uh, Jose, please. Uh, for me, when it comes to the, cons the aspect of... Uh, of uh, the security guarantee of how reliable the United States okay, is. Well, uh, usually, um, for example, in the Philippines, those who are loudest in questioning uh, the reliability of the United States are ironically those who also want it to go away. You know, so how can you test the reliability of of your ally if you want your ally to stay away from your place? So there's a that's the problem. That's a hypocrisy of those. In, a, in the Philippines to call for that. But, you know, for an ally, for, for to test the guarantee of the United States, we can see that it is willing to put its boots on the ground or its ships in the sea or it's make its feet wet in the South China Sea, you know, putting itself in the line of fire, you know. So if there is any um, incident, you know, uh, with the Chinese, for example, in the South China Sea, uh, uh, the United States forces are there, you know, that's why we have their phone ops, you know, there are multilateral exercises, all of these things are, 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 are specifically not just to train, but also as a show of force, you need to, to present a physical presence in that area, because what happened was that uh, we've learned our lesson from that mistake that the Philippines did in 1991, which was to kick out the United States bases, which China took advantage of, okay, and uh, now, uh, um, the only way to push back is to ex establish a physical counter um, balance to that. And that by itself is when we see the Americans willingly doing that. And ironically, and uh, even surprisingly, during the time of Trump, which was said to be um, um, a low point by, by many observers. But still, you know, the United States was still pushing for the, for the Philippines to 
to um, participate or, or to accept, you know, uh, joint or bilateral activities. It was Duterte himself because of that, uh, of his uh, treasonous uh, activities with China, which is why we were always uh, uh, hemming and hawing during that time. You know? So basically that, that's my take on on uh, on the reliability of the, of, of these uh, American security guarantees. Uh, yeah, uh, so so that's that's a very significant. I I would like to highlight the one other point uh, here that uh, that uh, uh, the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and the 2016 uh, uh, law the decision of the arbitrary uh, jurisdiction regarding um, uh, that uh, the, in the joint statement it is also mentioned that uh, the that the three countries wants to push China but uh, China uh, referred it null and void so uh, how important this is towards uh, uh, towards the decision that was uh, uh, that was uh, uh, made in the in uh, comprehended in the in the 2016 so, uh, Professor Renato, would you like to say something on this? Uh, about uh, yeah. I think you're uh, yes, you're referring to the July 12, 2016 arbitral ruling, yes. which declares, of course, that China's nine dash line. Now, of course, the Chinese have made it ten, has simply no legal basis under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. So, in fact, this is the basis of the Philippines' archipelagic defense concept. The goal of the archipelagic defense force uh, project of uh, concept, of course is to project the armed forces of the Philippines away from the island, main islands of Luzon, into our exclusive economic zone. And the basis of this is, of course, the fact that we don't recognize and we will never accept China's 10, uh, 10 dash line claim, which has, of course, been declared by the arbitral ruling as, of course, uh, null and void. It does not, you know, it cannot simply be accepted under international law. You just don't put those dots on the sea and basically declare to the world this is my territorial waters. So, and of course, this has been supported. Interestingly, it was Japan that upheld this uh, before, of course, the Philippines finally acknowledged this in 2020 under the Duterte administration. Uh, the United States, interesting, interestingly, although it's not a, a party to UNCLOS, also reaffirmed its commitment, basis commitment, uh, South China Sea policy on the arbitral ruling almost a day after the Philippines acknowledged this in July, uh, we acknowledge this in July, on July 12, the United States State Department acknowledged this on July 13, 2020, 2020. So the three countries basically base their, of course, South China Sea uh, policy based on the arbitral ruling. Yeah, they're simply, they do not recognize the legality of China's 10 dash line claim. Uh, right. So uh, this is like uh, we uh, just um, conclude on this defense uh, uh, capability uh, of the three countries. Like they have strengthened, like the bolster this uh, security cooperation during with with this joint statement mentioned, like uh, providing the uh, patrolling vessels to the Philippines and the Japan is like uh, invested um, in 2022 and 20. Three um, in in Philippines also like like let's go to the economic point like uh, when uh, is is the first time the like Indo Pacific Economic Framework and, uh, the first uh, uh, partnership uh, uh, corridor and in infrastructure and in investment the Luzon corridor how important how strategic um, what is the strategic importance of this corridor and. Uh, uh, is this the alternative to countering China's BRI project and. Uh, 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 and uh, but how how successful it is, Professor Sato? Would you like to? Okay, sure. Yeah, I think the this is the first concrete and tangible uh, the project coming out of uh, IPF, and uh, you know this Luzon corridor is uh, very significant in the sense that. Uh, it offers uh, alternative, very viable alternative to the BRI, uh, Chinese-led uh, financing of uh, infrastructure development in Southeast Asia. Japan has been the largest uh, source of ODA in this region, but uh, Japan's financial power is on a relative decline 
and there's no way for Japan to keep matching the Chinese aid quantitatively. Japan was talking about the quality aid, but of course, uh, you know, both quality and quantity are important. And having the U.S. on board to jointly finance various projects, especially through uh, uh, the public-private cooperation, uh, is a very viable way of uh, countering China. The U.S. has been uh, very much uh, private financing oriented, but uh, you know this ideological difference between Japan and the U.S. on aid has uh, significantly narrowed in recent years, and uh, the policies of the two governments are, are better coordinated today. At the same time, I think the this project enhances the the Philippine central government's hand in dealing with uh, the municipal governments and their politicians who are vulnerable to the Chinese uh, influence operation. So, so from that point of view also, uh, it enhances the Philippines governance as well. Can I hold my, yeah, thanks, Professor Sato. Can I hold my, would you like to say on this? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, so I think it certainly uh, provides a, uh, a an attractive alternative, uh, in particular uh, to China's, uh, you know, digital Silk Road. I think that's very important because, um, you know, the United States and other uh, Western powers are, are very concerned with, you know, what comes with a Chinese uh, telecommunications uh, project. You know, how how does using Chinese equipment uh, and networks, uh, you know, open you up to certain vulnerabilities? So, uh, I'm glad to see that the uh, the Open RAN system, uh, which was part of that, um, you know, is going to provide an alternative to that, and I think it really sets the Philippines up on a good path to development uh, to be able to gain some, um, you know, some critical skills and a critical place in the supply chain uh, for everything from clean energy uh, to, you know, microelectronics. So everyone's really, you know, concerned about critical minerals and, uh, you know, microprocessors and, and chips. And so I think this is another good way to uh, to get an ally and partner into the game uh, on securing some of that uh, critical supply chain. Thanks. Yes, yes. All right. Thank you. And uh, Professor Renato. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Colonel Holman mentioned, of course, the economic significance, more significantly economic security significance in terms of raw materials that need not be exported to China raw. It could be processed in the Philippines and be part of the supply chain. More significantly, I would like to focus on the, uh, of course you have the uh, dimension of economic statecraft when you talk about the Luzon Corridor. Basically it's in a way, the Philippines making a strategic choice despite President Duterte's people to China in 2016. You know, middle in the uh, middle end of his term, he realized that Chinese uh, funding through the uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative was not simply coming, so he made a decision. You know, although Japan simply did not have enough capital to finance infrastructure projects in the whole of Southeast Asia, the Philippines opted for Japan. The biggest, uh, you know, projects, infrastructure projects here are being funded by Japan. That is, of course, the commuter rail system from Central Luzon going to Manila and the subway system. And of course, you cannot also ignore the strategic dimension when you talk about the Luzon Corridor, it will link, of course, two former American bases, you know, Subic, mm -hmm. Olongapo City, and Clark. Uh, Subic, of course, is a strategic port. Then you have, have Clark Air Base. You still have that air base there, uh, although it's used for civilian, but they could be used, of course, in terms of any contingency. Then you link it to another port that is Metro Manila, and, of course, a southern port, Batangas, that could hardly be reached by Chinese missiles or Chinese fighters, or I'm sorry, bombers. So in a way you create that corridor to basically prepare Luzon, just in case you have any contingency in the South China Sea, or of course, more significantly in Taiwan by creating that corridor. 
where you have core supply troops could easily move from southern Luzon up to central and northern Luzon. This is my take. I, you know, I'm not yeah. a military uh, official. I'm just an academic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Like uh, how strategically uh, important that it's connected to the Subic to the Clark. Like uh, we, we just uh, read in the in the joint statement. And uh, Jose, uh, uh, your comments on this? All right, I, I also agree with uh, on my dear friend also. Uh, uh, Dr. De Castro, not uh, Professor De Castro, on his on the redundancy also of the bases, okay, because we need uh, that's needed, okay. Uh, at the same time, you know, when you have this economic, uh, uh, when you when you improve the economic basis of the Philippines, you know, which is also the target of this uh, of this all of these economic activities, it allows the Philippines to sustain and maintain its military modernization, okay, um, because gone are the days of the 1950s and 60s where we would look at good old Uncle Sam and give us all the freebies in the world, okay? Uh, but now it's much of uh, our modernization, although we do have a lot of assistance coming from Japan and the United States, uh, much of, uh, there are also big ticket items that uh, we are funding by ourselves. And in order to do that, you have to have a strong economy also. And economic assistance, um, building up our infrastructure, it allows for more investments to come in, more investments to come in, uh, result in a healthier economy, you know, and then healthier economy provides the needed resources for, for example, um, let's say we come, we we uh, create a, we buy a multi-role fighter fleet, you know, those don't come cheaply, okay, and the, their maintenance doesn't come cheaply, and we can't always look at Uncle Sam to give us everything for that, you know, so we have to, we have to maintain that also, and like I said, all of this also, uh, it's like it's a very um, say multi pronged approach to strengthening the Philippines. You know, you have the assistance coming in from uh, Japan and the United States. You have the physical alliances that we would be having in, the, in terms of the activities. Then you also have the um, the strengthening of our economy, which also in a way yes, the economy alone, but at the same time also it also affects also our capacity to modernize our military and sustain it, you know, absorb and sustain. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, um, quite interesting. And in this, uh, like uh, uh, connecting with this, I uh, uh, would like to uh, discuss some implications to the region about this uh, uh, trilateral summit. And first uh, and foremost, like uh, the China, uh, the action budget, China summoned uh, the diplomats uh, from both the countries, from Philippines and uh, and Japan's so uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, China is not happy whatever is going on in this and uh, uh, again and again repeatedly uh, saying that um, that uh, Asian countries should uh, should uh, uh, do on on its own like uh, they they can they can um, have in the Asian manner like whatever the Asian um, uh, Asian manner of uh, providing the security or, or whatever the Asian solutions for that, uh, rather than going aligning with the United States. So, so what uh, uh, do you think uh, on this? Uh, just uh, I want to go ahead with the Renato. Like, uh, what's the why China summoned the diplomats and the other Southeast Asian countries? Like you just mentioned, uh, what are the they, they think about this? Uh, it's we won't accept what they call the Chinese dream you know, by Xi Jinping, that Asians should resolve their own problems. Not when you have a big Asian power that thinks it knows all the solution to all the Asian problem. It bases the solution simply uh, on its selfish national interests. So no way. Uh, we rather have an open system. We still adhere to what we call the uh, idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, where you don't have a dominant hegemonic expansionist power basically telling other Asian countries what to do and what to accept from that, you know, great uh, imperial and expansionist power. Professor Sato. Thank, you know, the answer there is thanks, but yeah. no thanks. <laughs> Professor Sato. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, it's very important that uh, all Asian countries want the U.S. to be engaged there may be some variance in degree, but uh, all of them want the U.S. to stay. And uh, I think uh, the Philippines, uh, as uh, Rennie pointed out, 
is probably the most progressive member of uh, ASEAN in that sense. Uh, Philippines welcomes the U.S. presence to the, the greatest extent. Some other members, I think, will be more cautious about the uh, U.S. presence for uh, various reasons. I think uh, those that have land borders with China uh, are more cautious and and also those with uh, inter-ethnic relations involving Chinese ethnicity within their border. That's also a reason for being cautious. And the Muslim population's reason to be cautious with the closer relationship with the United States. And so in that sense, uh, you know, countries like Vietnam, you know, with land border with China, is very cautious uh, with the uh, uh, US. And despite uh, the recently upgraded uh, comprehensive strategic partnership between the US and Vietnam, uh, immediately after that, uh, Hanoi was, uh, you know, preparing a nicely uh, uh, decorated welcome for uh, Xi Jinping. So, so in that sense, I think Vietnam's balancing efforts will continue. And, and for that, the Vietnam is not likely to uh, expand, for example, uh, the base accesses. Uh, you know, the US uh, ship visitation to Vietnamese ports will be, you know, continue to be uh, limited to a very small scale. Uh, Malaysia has been doing a lot with Americans, uh, but they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> they they will continue doing quietly, in in my view. So uh, I think uh, we'll see some variances among ASEAN countries. Yeah, you rightly mentioned about Malaysia. That uh, today I was uh, I was just reading the Malaysian foreign minister said they are unfazed by the U.S.-China comp competition, but appears to be benefit from both of the both uh, uh, powers. So uh, there's a like uh, we just uh, I I, I um, uh, can recollect uh, my memories so that in the last year we just. Uh, uh, discussing the Southeast Asian countries' um, uh, alignment towards the United States, and there was none like uh, we we could have said that uh, okay, this is now the Philippines. At this time, the Philippines has a, a step, a moving step ahead in the security cooperation and the, and of course the economic uh, the uh, uh, economic investment and in this Indo-Pacific economic framework and. Uh, uh, Colonel Holman uh, uh, would like to have your brief comment, and then we'll go to the for the questions. If the if our students have uh, some a few questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, I think it's important to note that you know, as you mentioned, the Philippines has taken a step out uh, and upgraded that relationship <clears throat> with the U.S. But it's not just with the U.S. Uh, when you uh, partner with the U.S., you're tying yourself into all the other ally and partners. You know, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, potentially. Um, so they're joining a, a bigger club, not just the U.S. club. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how the other uh, Southeast Asian nations, especially those with uh, um, claims in the South China Sea, it'll be interesting to see how they view uh, the Philippines move and whether or not they follow suit. I think they would have to you know, believe that the benefits of having full access to their EEZ and all the maritime resources, whether it's fish, oil, natural gas, critical minerals, if they can do the cost benefit analysis and think, you know, it's worth it to, you know, press, maybe the ASEAN uh, community can come together and, and support each other uh, in their own individual claims. Thanks. Jose, you, you want to comment on this, Jose? Uh, for me, um, what we're discussing right now, what we're seeing right now, in, uh, either the trilateral agreements and all of this, um, these are things that are, how do I say this? These are um, 
uh, this should have happened 2016, you know, in a sense that in terms of the Philippines upping its uh, participation in the internationalization of the issue. Okay, uh, but of course, we again we had that that person called Duterte, you know, and that uh, created all of the problems, you know. But now we're back again, you know, and I think uh, the Philippines has its uh, work cut out for it in a sense that. Um, uh, uh, it will have to build it. It'll, it uh, it uh, through its diplomacy, talking with its ASEAN part um, um, partners. You know, it will have to build that consensus that will be supportive of uh, what the Philippines is doing with its triad. It's the bridge between that uh, you have that trilateral uh, partnership, and then with ASEAN. So I see the Philippines in that role, doing what it should have, what should have been done. Uh, more uh, more than six years ago, it, right uh, following what happened in the arbitration victory. That was, the, the momentum was lost because of what Duterte did. You know? But now we're on the right track. Hopefully, uh, this is sustained after 2028, just hopefully. All right, uh, so uh, thank you everyone. And uh, now I would like to move towards the audience. If they have any questions, please, uh, please go ahead. Uh, and Chris, you have some question uh, you po posted in the chat. Would you like to ask the question? Uh, like sure thing. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. No, this has been a very, very provocative discussion, and I appreciate everybody's perspective. Um, one of the, the question that I had, I put it in the chat, but I'll summarize it here. This is, I note this is not the first trilateral summit we've had. The U.S., South Korea, and Japan had a trilateral summit not that long ago, too, which was another major step, just like this one. And so I'm curious, um, you know, looking at the big picture and how this trilateral summit of last week fits into the, you know, bigger picture of the wider web of alliances, you know, where do you put this alongside that summit? Do you see any relationship or any potential relationship between the two? Is the timing purely coincidental? I'm, I'm curious what... Anybody's perspective on that? I'll go ahead and jump in here. So, um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, there's been an awful lot of activity with the Philippines uh, over the past, uh, you know, six plus months. And I think it's, you know, if China had not been as assertive as it has over the past six plus months, um, I'm not sure this would be the right time for for this to happen. Uh, but you know, I think essentially the PRC has has pushed the Philippines into our arms, as many might say. Um, I think this particular multilateral uh, or trilateral grouping uh, allows. Uh, the allies and partners there in the Indo-Pacific who are all of the same mind uh, that the rules-based order, uh, which has endured since uh, the conclusion of World War II, is the best way uh, to, to uh, retain stability and peace uh, in that part of the world. Um, you know, there's, there's the other groupings, as you mentioned, the, the trilateral with Japan and Korea, uh, which is, is focused on North Korea and, and the threat that that poses. Um, you've also got the Quad and AUKUS, which were mentioned earlier. So um, it's all the same players, and, and they're all starting to cooperate more and share technology and train together and exercise together. And I think that's going to uh, provide that's going to provide a tremendous boost to deterrence overall, and, and will hopefully make Beijing kind of relook their approach you know, to their neighbors and to the other powers in the region. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, anyone has a question? Uh, audience, please, uh, do you have any question? Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you so much for all the great views on the trilateral summit between the US, Philippines and Japan. Uh, my question is mainly regarding the U.S. capabilities and mainly concerning the logistics and fundings and feasibility. Uh, we can see that two major allies, uh, U.S. allies, namely the Ukraine and Israel, are already involved in ongoing conflicts. 
And now we can also see Iran emerging as a major threat to the U.S. interests in the Gulf region, especially with its improving military or missile technology with collaboration with Russia and China. Given the ongoing conflicts already affecting the eco economic stability of the U.S. and the Western he Hemisphere altogether, how is the U.S. plan to deal with if there's another front opens up in the South China Sea, will the U.S. able to protect its interest in the Europe, uh, Middle East, and the Asia-Pacific region simultaneously? Thank you so much. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Oh, God, please, who wants to jump in first? I'll, I'll just uh, shoot first and then, but very briefly, very briefly. Um, if you look at the conflicts in Ukraine and in Israel, um, it's not the U.S. going alone. Okay, In Ukraine, you have uh, the, the NATO alliance coming in also, supporting uh, Ukraine's logistical and material requirements and financial requirements. Okay, uh, They're actually covering up now because of the fact they're covering the, the the problem now that the U.S. has because of uh, uh, part of, because of politics internal politics in the U.S. So the, the the tranche has not yet been released, but because of that, it's NATO stepping up. In the same way, now if you look also at what happened in the Middle East, uh, you would have here uh, in the interception of the Iranian uh, missiles, okay? and also in the interception of the Houthi missiles and uh, drones. You would see here that it wasn't just the U.S. alone. They also had a partner. It also had its allies. The United Kingdom was there. France, uh, who is not a, technically an ally, but actually a major partner, is also involved with in, in the Middle East. So so it's not. So that's how the U.S. also addresses it. So now when you talk about the maritime domain in the South China Sea, uh, you have assets of the United States that, that, is not, that are not committed in uh, those, men, those, re, uh, those uh, areas that you mentioned about. And even... Um, with their assets here, together with their partners here, which is Japan, uh, Australia, and of course the Philippines, you know, and finally the Philippines has assets that matter already. Finally, okay, after so many generations, uh, is that is that um, that they already have overwhelming superiority over the Chinese. And in fact, if the Chinese try to stir things up in Taiwan, if they try to invade Taiwan at this point in time, oh, they will be severely defeated. They will be, it will be a massacre of of, of Chinese. Uh, so at this point in time, there are there are uh, there are there are uh, still forces that are not committed. Okay, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Professor mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the Philippines and Japan are two U.S. allies, but as U.S. allies, we have to accept two realities. Number one, the United States is a global superpower that has other concerns: Europe, Middle East, elsewhere. So there's a reality. It will ne never focus simply on the region. And second point, of course, the United States is an external power. And yeah, that's something that the Ch Chinese are always harping on us. And that's the geostrategic reality. The United States is what we call a offshore strategic balancer. So uh, this is to reality. The United States will not always be here forever on the basis of geography. That's why actually the trilateral security relations is not about the United States or the Philippines, it's about Japan. It's about Japan taking a more active security role in the region simply because the United States will not be here forever. So again, I go back to the point raised by you say, you know, allies would have to basically assume certain responsibilities. We assume that responsibility by basically providing the geographic base from where, again, Jose mentioned about those uh, exigencies that American, Japanese, Australian, probably South Korean forces will be operating just in case you have a major con uh, uh, contingency happening north of Luzon, that's of course Taiwan. Uh, Japan, of course, will be providing the maritime capabilities, the bulk of that maritime capabilities. So again, I go back to what Jose mentioned, allies, US allies must assume greater responsibilities. Thanks, Gunnar Holman, you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, Certainly, uh, the U.S. has been pushing, uh, you know, our allies and partners uh, to contribute more to their own uh, defense. But that contribution uh, will reflect in a an increase in capability uh, for the uh, combined force. Uh, 
if you will. So I know we've been doing the same thing in Korea, although we are still there providing that strategic nuclear deterrent. We have been pushing uh, the Koreans to take a more active role in their own defense, and they've stood up, uh, you know, they're on a path to stand up a command that will essentially take the lead in that defense, as opposed to in the past where the U.S. has kind of been the lead uh, in that defensive relationship. Uh, so similar to Japan, I know we're encouraging uh, Japan to, uh, you know, not only, you know, engage directly with other Southeast and South Asian nations, uh, but we want to make sure that it's not just the U.S. Uh, that's saying, hey, this rules-based international order is the best way to go. I think we got everybody, uh, you know, in that region agreeing that that's the best way to go. Um, they, of course, want to keep the uh, the economic ties and, and pipelines open with Beijing uh, because of all the capability that they can uh, they can bring. They just don't want to deal with the you know the uh, the one sided aspect of that relationship. Thank you. Um, Jason, you have uh, the one last question, and then uh, we will conclude uh, the the discussion. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for the discussion and sharing the insights with us. So my question is about. Uh, so uh, my question is about um, U.S. domestic politics. So if Trump is elected, I'm curious to know your thoughts of how it's going to affect this relationship between Japan, U.S., and Philippines. Um, like, to what direction would it steer it? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we, maybe uh, we will go first in this question. Can I hold on? Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, we've seen this same concern, you know, over in Europe with NATO, uh, you know, asking themselves what will happen if we have a change in administration. How can we, uh, you know, I think the word used is Trump proof, you know, this alliance. And I think you'll see some of the same types of, um, you know, activities happening in the Indo-Pacific, you know, trying to, to tighten that lattice work of alliances so that it's, you know, it doesn't matter which uh, party is in power, uh, you know, those alliances will persist. They may not blossom uh, as they're blossoming now, uh, but they won't uh, be dismantled, I don't think, anytime soon. Yep, all right. Uh, anyone wants to jump in on that question? Okay, uh, so uh, so that last question that we have from the one most uh, audiences there, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to ask you a question. I am very appreciate to join here as an APU student. And I want to ask you about the about the problem of the Taiwan, which is between the mainland China and Taiwan. I think um, considering of his age, the Xi Jinping's age, he is over 70 right now. And he and I think um, he wants to make something like a bigger issues or a bigger achievement. So I think Personally, I think that to make an achievement, I think he will start the uh, invade Taiwan in, in a few decades or something like that. I want to ask you about how do you think about the it will start soon or it won't happen in the near future? It's just my, it's, that is my question. Thank you. Uh, can I butt in? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have the statement by uh, outgoing U.S. Indo-PACOM Commander General uh, John Aquilino, who had, been, who had visited the Philippines several times, and he mentioned this in the last uh, Senate Defense Committee hearing. Uh, he said, you know, uh, looking at the face of Chinese arms modernization, military modernization, China might take that big step of, you know, crossing the Taiwan Strait by 2027. So that's what he said. You know, take it with a grain of salt. But that's the assessment of the highest ranking Indo uh, PACOM uh, uh, commander. Yes. I, I, yeah. I can, mm -hmm. yeah, I, sure. I can add to, uh, to add to that. Um, in 2022, I was interviewed and I was asked by, by a reporter, what do I think about Ukraine? Okay, Will Russia invade? And then logically, I made this uh, assessment. 
No, uh, if, if uh, Russia invades, it has X number of forces. It's not enough to run over uh, Ukraine. It, it will suffer horribly, I said. Um, so logically, it would not happen. Then a few days later, <laughs> Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, and we know what happened. He got beaten up and, and so on. So it's, 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 if we look at, uh, if you look at uh, comparative strengths, you know, um, superiority is with the, uh, uh, um, with the uh, uh, countries in the trilateral uh, partnership and uh, elsewhere. But the thing is that wars are, occur because of the mental condition of the leader, okay? And at this point in time, we're not really sure what is the mental condition of Xi Jinping. You know, in the same vein that uh, what is the mental, what was the mental condition of Putin? And then, with with without looking at logic, he invaded um, uh, uh, Ukraine. In the same vein, um, Xi Jinping might just throw uh, caution and logic in the wind and invade Taiwan for whatever purpose. Maybe it's because he really wants to secure Taiwan. Maybe he's, there's a, something internally that has to be deflected in the same way that the Argentine junta uh, invaded Falklands because they had an internal problem going on, which they wanted the people to be distracted from. Thanks. Uh, can I hold on? You wanted to, you want to say something? Yeah, I would just say that, uh, you know, every day that passes, not only does the PRC get better, but the allies and partners in the U.S. get better, um, you know, in that potential future contest. Um, so I think the deterrence is really what is going to hopefully uh, prevent a conflict. Um, and, and really, I think we need to, to, to all understand that, you know, the PRC has a much more difficult challenge ahead of them crossing the Taiwan Strait and taking Taiwan than say, <clears throat> you know, Putin did uh, on a land grab uh, in Europe. So uh, it's a much more logistically challenging uh, feat to pull off. And, and really the consequences of failure are regime, you know, the end of the regime. And that is of course the CCP's most dear and prized, uh, you know, attribute is that that they exist and, uh, you know, losing or, or coming up short on Taiwan uh, would certainly threaten that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think that the last question is uh, um, of that uh, interesting and important so that will, will let us keep thinking on this and issue will, uh, what are the new developments is happening in the trilateral alliance and, and in the wider Indo-Pacific. So we conclude this uh, uh, discussion here. And uh, um, I would like to say that the views uh, presented here are personal, should not be constituted to any organization and institute. And I would like to thank from the, on behalf of the consortium, I'd like to thank each uh, uh, panelist and speaker, uh, Professor Renato, Professor Sato, Colonel Hallman and Jose. That's a very interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much uh, for your time. And, and thank you, audience, for uh, being the part of this discussion and uh, uh, putting the uh, very interesting question there. Thanks, Dr. Indu. Right. Uh, look thank forward you. to uh, the next right, one. Thank you.